From Quito, Ecuador, my name is Carla Gonzalez, and this is From the South, the evening news brief on Telesur English. We begin this new edition right now. Congress has started an impeachment process against President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski after corruption accusations linked him to the Brazilian company Odebrecht. 130 Congress members will meet ne next Thursday to vote for the removal of President Kuczynski. According to the Peruvian Constitution, two-thirds or 87 votes are required for the impeachment. A correspondent in Lima, Verónica Insuasti, has more details in the next report. Hola, ¿qué tal? Bueno, en caso if the impeachment against Pedro Pablo Kuczynski comes into effect, the country's constitution dictates that the first vice president of Peru, Martín Vizcarra, would have to take office. If Vizcarra refuses to become president, it would be the second vice president, Mercedes Arauz, who would lead the nation, although she can too refuse, and in that case, it be the president of the Congress, Luis Galarreta, as the one assigned to take office for a year. During this time, he would require to call for elections to choose a president and 130 congressmen. President Pedro Pablo Kisinski remains in his home since his last public appearance, where he is meeting with several members of his political party as well as lawmakers, ministers, and experts that are advising him on what to do next. President del Congreso, Veronica Tausti from Peru. Although Peru has one of the richest sea coasts in the world, official sources state that 70% of the fish that people consume is imported. Why does this happen and who does this benefit? We'll tell you more in the next report. Along the Peruvian shore, more than 60,000 fishermen provide the market with fish for human consumption, according to the Ministry of Production. But this same institution declared that only three out of every 10 fish concerts are produced in Peru. We have the best fish in Peru. I don't know why we need to import anything. We have all the raw material. People come from other countries. They take our goods and then they sell them back to us. According to the Fishing Federation, this happens due to President Kuczynski's neoliberal politics, which allowed transnationals to fish 2.8 million tons of Peruvian anchoveta, while independent Peruvian fishermen can only fish a tenth of that figure through the whole year. Supreme decrees are given, which favor a few companies by allowing them to produce nothing but fish flow. They don't care about independent companies and what they can do for our internal market. This has been extremely prejudicial to the market. In this way, independent fish concert factories have seen the raw material rated. In Ancash region, for example, independent companies have let go over 60,000 employees according to the union's guild. Unfortunately, in our country, we always put the big corporations in front of small businesses or independent companies, even if the latter can become investments that will feed the population and can lead to a national conserves company which will benefit everyone. Policies of trade liberalization are another factor that negatively influence this sector. Small fish concert companies tell us that they have to compete with imported products which are subsidized in their countries of origin and which are allowed to Peru paying almost zero taxes. After a long session in Congress in Argentina, protests emerge in almost... We now go to Argentina, where outrage continues to grow after a long session in Congress. Protests have emerged in almost every neighborhood of the city of Buenos Aires against this pension reform proposed by President Mauricio Macri. We have more details in the next report from our correspondent in the country. In the middle of the debate for the pension reform, a massive event sprang up in the least expected neighborhoods, reaching all the way to Plaza de Mayo. Sectors that supported the government's policies took to the streets to reject the reform. It's the Argentine people who shout loudly and say enough. 
and who deal with repression and bad moments and go to the streets to demand that their rights are respected. It's an absolutely spontaneous mobilization, a consequence of the insensitivity of the government and the cynicism with which they are communicating a cut to retirees of billions of pesos. The truth is that the Argentinian people are not willing to let the threat be cut off by its thinnest part. The Cambiemos Alliance, accompanied by lawmakers, finally turned the provisional reform into a law which reduces the benefits for pensioners. Those with disabilities, former Malvinas war combatants, and those receiving subsidies for children or pregnancy. This is basically a very strong adjustment on the most neglected sectors, and with less lobbying capacity. Because it's not true that it's the only solution. Market could think about charging a little to the sectors that were freed from paying taxes for giving their debt. It's not like that. It's against the retirees to make a buck adjustment. The next day, the elderly began to suffer the economic measures imposed by Macri's government against those who have less and reject the new pension law that harms them even more and takes away their hopes of living with dignity. In reality, the reform not only harms retirees, removing them from what they will receive, but will also harm the next generations. Because if you have to retire at 70 years old, you will see groups that will need to continue working because the government needs to pay the external Debt. But at the end, the debate was over after leaving more than 60 people injured and hundreds detained, opening a wound that would be difficult to close. Earlier today, Argentina's President Mauricio Macri gave a news conference where he defended and thanked the police for their actions during the protests. He said he was sure the violence was planned by opposition groups. But what I want to say what I want to tell you is that all that violence we saw was clearly orchestrated. We will face it with justice to understand who was responsible. Because it wasn't spontaneous. In Argentina, we live in a climate of peace. There is hope for the future. Senators have denounced the methods used by the police against demonstrators and members of Congress who are supporting this protest. They say the police have violated human rights even to the extent of using torture. In a picture, we can see Argentinian police holding Congresswoman Mayra Mendoza and spraying pepper spray into her mouth. And in other videos posted on Twitter, police are seen spraying a pensioner several times with pepper spray and then hitting him with a truncheon. In other videos, we can also see policemen running over protesters with motorbikes after officials fire what seems to be rubber bullets. So two days after the electoral court declared him the winner of last month's election, the Honduran president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, has addressed the nation to thank the people for re-electing him. He said he would not let them down. La aceptación. We'll bring peace, understanding, and progress. As a civilian and as elected president of Honduras, I humbly accept the people's will. I think it's not time for triumphalism or celebration. It's the time to thank you from the bottom of my soul, to every voter that trusted me, that supported me with conviction. I know you have made sacrifices and have risked your life to defend democracy and your right to choose. I am committed to not breaking your trust and honor your hope with work. On his part, the opposition candidate Salvador Nasralla has continued to denounce in Washington what he says was fraud in the presidential elections. Que quede claro, no vine a Washington a pedir... To be clear, I didn't come to Washington to receive orders, nor did I come here to ask for support for my electoral victory, a triumph that was legitimized by the people's will and their sovereign right, as the vast majority gave me their vote in the November 26 elections. Today, the people are defending this on the streets of Honduras. They are being violently repressed by the Honduran government, which has destroyed the rule of law in the country. In Honduras and anywhere else in the world, a government which takes this kind of action has only one name, dictatorship. And the Honduran opposition has continued its protest against this official result. Across the country, opposition demonstrators defied the police as they denounced fraud in the electoral count. The opposition had been demanding a total recount of all the ballot boxes. But 
Now they have shifted to demanding fresh elections, as suggested by the Organization of American States. We are demonstrating because we know Salvador Nasralla won the election and the government cowardly stole the election from us. We don't accept the official results because we won, Salvador won, the people won. We do not accept the results, so we are going to be here in the streets. We spoke to the correspondent in Tegucigalpa, Heather Gies, on the reactions to the recent developments, and this is what she had to say. Since the announcement on Sunday night, the results, that people are not going to accept this result, a majority of Honduras do not accept Fernandez as the president, uh, and it's not just the opposition alliance led by Salvador Nazarella, also supporters of the Liberal Party have taken to the streets because they also say that this election process uh, has been illegitimate, uh, the chief of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, said that the, the election observation mission of the OIS still has serious doubts about the credibility of the results, and therefore, given that situation, uh, called for this election to completely be scrapped and new elections called. So uh, it's a bit of a difficult situation. Um, the National Party has rejected that call for new elections and instead called for a national dialogue. And I think it's... Uh, worthwhile to point out that that call for a dialogue is, is the same kind of language that was used in the wake of the 2009 U.S.-backed coup against former President Manuel Zelaya. And through that dialogue, which eventually led to um, a failed agreement, uh, sort of consolidated the coup because because of the failure of that agreement done through an OAS-backed dialogue, Manuel Zelaya was never uh, returned to power before the uh, elections in November 2009, which opposition groups said just uh, uh, was a continuation of the coup government and helped to consolidate that coup. So I think um, some political forces in the opposition are going to be very wary of this call for dialogue because uh, it's, it's not the first time that they're, they're hearing that language. More news in a minute. Stay with us. Marcelo Odebrecht, the former president of the Brazilian construction company, has been released from prison and placed under house arrest. The former CEO left a Curitiba prison after serving two and a half years behind bars. He will be given a monitoring ankle bracelet and returned to his luxury home in Sao Paulo. Odebrecht has been accused of several corruption and bribery cases in Brazil and across Latin America. Brazil's Congress was also due to vote this Tuesday on President Michel Temer's pension reform, which has been bitterly disputed. But after months of protests, trade unions and social movements were able to force a delay in the vote. On Monday, the Speaker of Brazil's lower house announced that lawmakers would restart their debate on February the 5th, before a vote two weeks later. The pension reform has been a central plank of Temer's neoliberal adjustments. Residents of Tijuana and San Diego gather at the U.S.-Mexico border fence on Saturday for a binational Christmas celebration, challenging their hardline stance from Washington on the fate of undocumented migrants north of the border. People gather on both sides of the fence, separating Baja California and California State for the Posada Without Borders Mass. This is a Mexican celebration which commemorates the biblical story of Joseph and Mary. U.S. deportees were amongst those gathered at this mass. President Donald Trump has pledged to extend the current U.S.-Mexico border wall and has also sought to streamline deportations of undocumented migrants. In my opinion, they are still uh, adjusting the machinery to deport more people. But uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, they, there might be more uh, deportees in the coming year. One of the most dangerous and insecure municipalities in Mexico is just a few kilometers away from the center of its capital. Let's take a look at this in the next report. Tanya lives at the top of the hill. 
She says the moment she leaves her house, she's in danger, and she's not the only one. In the last year, at least eight of every ten people here in Ekatepec have been victims of a crime, and many people live under lockdown. Here in our community, there are spaces for children to play or to do sports. We need schools, and our daily concern, more security. David grew up locked up at home, without being able to play football or ride a bicycle. He's grown up used to the risks of living in the most dangerous municipality in the state of Mexico. I was robbed. They came into Puente de Fierro to steal a copy. There was a police car there, but they didn't do anything. This municipality, which has always been governed by the current government party, the PRI, is not only one of the most densely populated, but it also has the highest poverty rate. In the neoliberal model that has operated for 30 years here in Mexico, one of its principles is the reduction of public spending. Ecatepec is exactly an expression of this neglect by the system. The last police commissioner quit when he didn't get results after two years. According to some experts, the solution is not having more police, but fighting poverty. No hay vigilancia, no hay resultados. Access to life and justice is not being made available to these people. We have suicides, femicides. There are cases of young men who are murdered for not handing over their cell phones, which means life here is worth less than a cell phone. The situation is worse for women, even though a gender alert is in place. It's estimated that femicides have doubled since 2015. Since January 2016, 279 human rights activists and social leaders have been assassinated in Colombia. Social organizations say that the affected are facing impunity and re-victimization from the Colombian state. Last Thursday and Friday, four social leaders were killed in Colombia. Cristian Delgado, human rights coordinator of the movement Patriotic March, said that during 2017, 163 social leaders have been killed in 23 of the country's departments. A member of the COCAM was murdered in Córdoba by a group of military, and an AWA member in Nariño, another in Magdalena, and we're confirming a death in the Sucre department. These are four murders only this weekend. In the middle of the recent murders, the Defense Ministry, Luis Carlos Villegas, denied these crimes and assured that the majority of these murders are due to neighborhood and personal problems. The statement from the government official caused outrage from several groups of people, which consider that the affirmation revictimizes the murder. The Defense Minister is making a huge mistake and I think he's protecting the murderers. The denial by the national government is not new in the history of Colombia. Three decades ago, when the extermination of the left-wing Patriotic Party began, the Colombian state also said that the crimes were due to personal conflicts. Today, it's known that in the middle of this denial, more than 5,000 militants of Patriotic Party were murdered. This has already happened on other occasions, when the government tried to hide the extermination of the Patriotic Party, for example and try to say that the deaths were all because of personal problems, just like the minister is saying. And that is disrespectful to the victims. A few days ago, the social leaders put on masks to protect their identity and announced that they too could also be murdered. Their words full of pain and fear were not heard by the national government, which today shows indifference against the violent reality these people face. Colombia's president, Juan Manuel Santos, has named Gustavo Bell as the new government chief negotiator in the peace talks with the ELN after his predecessor stepped down. Santos said the government will work towards extending a ceasefire with the Marxist rebels, while the ELN has said it's willing to continue the ceasefire if there is sufficient progress in peace talks and that it would assess the government's willingness to overcome these obstacles. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
marked the end of electoral campaigns in Catalonia. Elections were convened by Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy after dismissing the Catalonian government, dissolving their parliament and invoking Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution, all in response to Catalonia's declaration of independence on October 27. 38 hours left before polling stations open and political messages have gotten even louder. The final televised debate happened on Monday. The main topics discussed were the economy, Article 155, and imprisoned or exiled politicians. Our plan of action, as soon as it's possible, will be to form a government, a government that puts a stop to Article 155. The first thing the President of the Generalitat will do, if elected, will be to once again appoint the previous government and to fix the mess created by the intervention of Article 155. Unionists assured that seceding from Spain is not the solution to Catalan's problems. I believe that the best alternative to secession is not immobility, but reformism. You should join the opposition and leave the way open for a democratic government that cares about Catalonians' real issues. Beyond the televised debates, this campaign has brought forth controversial statements. Who do you think is responsible for the lack of leadership in the ERC, the Catalan European Democratic Party, Together for Catalonia, and all the other independence fighters? Who was responsible for beheading their leadership? Mariano Rajoy and the People's Party. By saying this, independence supporters consider that the deputy prime minister admits justice has been favoring her party. Leaving all these parties with no leadership is something that was accomplished when the judicial power sent those leaders to jail. Another statement that has raised eyebrows comes from a former Minister of Public Works and Transportation who called the independence movement an infected wound on society that must be cleaned. Our society is wounded and it must be healed, but before closing any wound, it must be disinfected. Polls show a tie between the independence movement and unionism, but the only poll that matters will happen this coming Thursday. Kenya's opposition politicians are preparing to inaugurate a People's Assembly to draw up a new constitution. But they are being threatened by the government. We have more details in the next report. These are the leaders and thinkers of the groups that reject the legitimacy of Kenya's elections and the current political system. Among them is David Ndi, who was stopped by armed men a couple of weeks ago. He's had experience in Kenya's post-colonial jails during the struggle for the 2010 constitution. Now they are resisting again and overcoming fear because their plan to serve their leader, Raila Odinga, as president was defined as treason by the government and it's punishable by death. Is a, a regime that is trying to reverse all the gains that Kenyans have made over the years trying to democratize this country. We have uh, chosen to go back to the people so that they can be able to exercise this sovereignty, uh, sovereignty di directly. David Ndi. David Ndi said that he wasn't arrested but abducted. They intimidated him with false accusations but then released him 24 hours later with no charges. We ordered have a government which is based on the basis of a and uh, illegitimate elections. Mm -hmm. So it will not be a surprise that uh, if they decide to go one step further and now resort to uh, the old uh, the sort of uh, authoritarian um, methods. We continue to act within the law and uh, when we have the law on our side, uh, what else do we have to fear? Raila, Raila Amolo Odinga, who plan to swear in as president, visits an opposition politician who just died after a long illness, but who was true to his conscience to the last. Odinga insisted that the people's assemblies do not violate the constitution. The rest I'm not at liberty to, to talk about. The organizing committee is competently handling that matter. El tren está en marcha. So the process is underway. The big question is how the government will react after declaring illegal the deliberations on the People's Assemblies. Desde Nairobi, Oscar Repelde para Telesur. A year after a jihadist drove a truck into a Christmas market crowd in Berlin, killing 12 and wounding 70, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has met with the victims' families for the first time. The families have criticized Merkel for failing to personally offer condolences. They also accused the authorities of her security failings and their clumsy handling of the aftermath of the assault. Flowers and other tributes were left at the site of the attack. 
Das sage ich für die ganze Bundes. For me, and I speak for the whole government, when I say we are working to improve the things that didn't go well, that we will do everything humanly possible to not only improve security, but also to offer people whose lives have been destroyed by this the possibility to return to normal life. And now let's take a look at some other news from around the world. The United States Republican-controlled Congress plans to vote on the final version of the controversial tech reform bill. A Senate vote is expected soon after, as Republicans are likely to overwhelmingly support the bill. The bill will overhaul the U.S. tax, but critics say the package is a deficit bloating giveaway to the country's super rich. If it passes, it will be the Republican Party's first major legislative triumph under President Donald Trump. Clashes over a failed push for independence in Iraqi Kurdistan between police and protesters have left five people killed and over 70 injured as security forces opened fire on a crowd of demonstrators. It marks the second day of trouble since the fallout from an independence referendum in September in which people majoritively voted yes, but the due sweeping reprisals from Baghdad. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees has told um, Somali refugees in Da'ab refugee camp in northern Kenya that they could go home if they wished to avoid food shortages in the camp, although they would be returning to a conflict zone. In October, a funding crisis saw the UN World Food Program cut basic food rations and cash in Da'ab and the housing of nearly a quarter of a million refugees by 50 percent. I think we have learned a lesson here over the past 25 years. This model of Having refugees closed in a closed camp in an area that has needs by itself is not a good model. We need to think otherwise. We need to think in the future, as we're doing in Kalobeye, the other side of Kenya, for the South Sudanese, into more open solutions where people have access to services and to the economy and we reinforce those services as opposed to creating a whole parallel system for the refugees. Because that parallel system which we have here shows its weaknesses, especially after 25, 30 years. Jordan's King Abdullah II and Pope Francis have met to discuss the U.S.'s decision to recognize Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, as well as the king's role as custodian of the city's holy sites. They discussed the peace process in the Middle East after the decision, in which the Pope has already called for a respect for the status quo of Jerusalem. In the Greek suburb of Kivseli, an anti-consumerism market has reopened just in time for Christmas. We have more details in the next report. A few cardboard boxes, a couple of color markers, plenty of imagination are enough to create a house, a dinosaur, or Christmas ornaments. We are here in Kipseli's market because we have set up a toy building workshop. We welcome all children, from the little ones to the older ones, so that they may build their own toys. The philosophy of the Christmas market is do it yourself. This way children begin to understand there is no need to buy things or spend a lot of money in order to celebrate Christmas. Here, they can even make the sweets they will share with their families. The children along with their parents decorate cookies with sugar and color them any way they want. The market also has room for social projects that take advantage of the season in order to finance projects that are developed throughout the year. We sell second-hand objects to finance professional help for people with mental illness. This initiative proves the best gift is not the most valuable one, but the one that passes on the most values. Volcano photographer Dr. Richard Roscoe has documented the spectacular eruption of an active volcano early December in the Amazonian Andes of Ecuador, known as Reventador. Roscoe captured the fiery explosions with wide-angle lenses and then sped up the video to show the activity over the course of a three-day period. Reventador's last recorded major activity was in 2002, when a huge eruption occurred and generated a 17-kilometer high eruption cloud wiping up a nearby village. And we've come to the end of this evening news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.
events told by their main.